Presentation Skills for Design Students, Episode 10. Hello and welcome to Presentation Skills for Design Students. My name's Christina Cantors and this is the podcast dedicated to helping design students everywhere improve their presentation and communication skills. It doesn't matter if you do architecture, landscape, graphics, photography, interior architecture, there's something we can all do to become confident, creative communicators. So get ready to take your next presentation to a whole new level. Are you a design student who dreams of getting that dream job with a client who says, oh, design my house, do whatever you want and just tell me how much it'll cost? Well, it happened to my next guest and he was only 25 years old. Matthew Bird from Studio Bird shares that incredible story, plus lots of advice for improving both your visual and verbal presentations. So be sure to stick around for that. Uh, We chat for about 20 minutes and then I have another great challenge of the week for you. But first, as I like to do, let's hear this week's story from Studio. And we have a joint story actually from Rebecca and Ash from who are doing interior architecture at Monash University and they're actually students of Matthews. Take it away girls. Yeah so we aim to create a sort of study social space for the students in the classroom environment. We were given a material of rope and we sort of adapted our brief and we've used um, rags all cut up into strips, crocheted them into this giant canopy that um, acted both as a separate area in the room but storage unit and yeah. <laughs> it worked really well with the lighting as well. So. Everyone's piece of the installation was completely different to the others but when they were together they just looked really beautiful and unique. And So although you have the one pattern that everyone's shown at the start it all changes Yeah. and that sort of changed the overall look of the whole piece. Because uh, I guess can't... everyone interpreted that pattern in their own way and they took on their, the training, I guess, of how to learn crochet in a different way. It's probably best not to have preconceived ideas of what it'll look like mm-hmm. um, because you do have to allow for that variation in everyone's abilities and their strengths. The most important bit is turning what may seem as an error at the time into an opportunity to yep, improve right. the overall piece. And embrace, <laughs> if you're working in a group, embrace everyone's faults and talents. Um, like our our pillars were formed from someone's fault and they became a beautiful piece of art. Um, Yeah. Thanks so much, Rebecca and Ash, for sharing that story with us. I think there's a really good lesson there, especially about when you're working with a group to embrace everyone's talents and, and strengths in different areas as well and to sort of let go a bit of your own control and just accept that everyone's going to do things and learn things in their own way and to just really be accepting of that. Thanks so much, girls, for sharing that. And, of course, if you would like to share your story from studio, all you have to do is head on over to designdrawspeak.com slash story and follow the links there and record your story and that would be awesome. I, I really love hearing your stories so, and I look forward to hearing many more too. Okay, now it's time to meet this week's special guest. This week I am pumped to be chatting with talented designer, avid traveller and guerrilla architect Matthew Bird from Studio Bird, a Melbourne-based boutique design studio. And and by guerrilla, I mean as in like renegade agitator, not the large hairy African ape. Um, Anyway, Matthew loves the concept of architecture as experiment and this is reflected in his work that ranges from architecture to interior design, performance projects and installation art. Check out Studio Bird's work at studiobird.com.au 
And there's plenty of great stuff on the Studio Bird Facebook page as well. So be sure to check that out. And I'll, I'll pop a link in the show notes at designdrawspeak.com slash 010. Oh, episode 10. Uh, that's pretty cool. I'm pretty happy. Double digits, yeah. Anyway, uh, moving on. Matthew also teaches industrial architecture at Monash University in Melbourne. So I was really interested to hear his thoughts on student presentations. So let's get to it. So I'm sitting here at uh, Captains of Industry in Melbourne CBD with Matthew Bird from Studio Bird. We're enjoying some lovely ginger beer that they've made here and he's been filling me in on all the exciting things that are coming up. So uh, thanks so much, Matthew, for joining me on the podcast. Absolutely. A pleasure to be here. Now, could you just give us a bit of a brief background of, of yourself and your involvement at Monash Uni? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, I, I guess... To really sort of begin with, it's sort of, you know, the background is I am from Melbourne, I grew up in Melbourne, um, and from, you know, the, the silly age of 12, wanted to be an architect and had my, um, you know, I guess my eye set on attending RMIT University. And so, and so from such a young age, I was, you know, really keen to pursue, I guess, you know, a career in architecture um, with, with the support, I guess, of... Melbourne's really eccentric scene of design and architecture. So, as a, as, you know, so from 12, I started, you know, noticing all the, you know, cool buildings that we have around and, you know, finally got through high school and got into RMIT. But not RMIT architecture, I actually started doing a drafting course first at RMIT TAFE, which was an amazing sort of grounding experience. But thereafter, I, you know, I attended up, um, RMIT for five years and you know, got my first job at Cassandra Complex with Cassandra Fay, which was amazing. Spent a bit of time overseas in London working for a really amazing interior team. Came back to Melbourne, started working for ARM Architecture for a few years, and in that time, I started building my own sort of vocabulary of design and um, created, started Studio Bird, which really is a, it's, a, it's not so much a business, but I, I see it more of a, you know, at that time, it's just an enterprise to actually manifest my ideas without the control of like you know having to work for somebody else. And so I started creating guerrilla style architecture. Um, so on a you know on a beer budget, like materials from Bunnings. So what's what's guerrilla style architecture? Well, pretty much not asking permission, <laughs> I'm just doing it. Um, That's so, awesome. And like I didn't really realize I was doing that. I just thought actually I actually. And contributing to whatever I was doing, you know, the value of, of the space. So my little rental apartment at the time, you know, completely figured it out without actually talking to the owners. I think I sort of really enjoyed that process. And, you know, really enjoyed sort of installing, I guess, you know, experimental and unorthodox ways of describing space and personal, essentially personalizing space. Uh, and, you know, in that time I started teaching as well. Went back to RMIT and started teaching sessionally in both the interior discipline but also the architecture discipline, which was incredible. So, I guess, so new as a graduate, I still felt like a graduate, um, you know, starting to teach my way of architecture and, you know, interior. And w- with this sort of bubbling business of Studio Bird, I suddenly got this incredible job offer from this beautiful Indian couple to design and build their house here in Melbourne. Um, as they called it, their summer house. Super wealthy you know, Indian family. And it was an incredible experience because they pretty much, you know, at 25 said, hey Matt, we give you full range. You can do whatever you like. We want. The only stipulation is that you manage the entire project because we're off in, you know, India or the UK. And, you know, we want you to do the architecture, the interior and the landscape and, you know, go through the planning process, everything. And That's every designer's dream. Oh, it was insane. <laughs> and, you know, and then they did the whole incredible, you know, question, how much do you think this would cost? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know, I guess my time at ARM and with Santa Fe, I sort of learned actually good design costs, you know, and put in my, my fee proposal and they accepted it, you know, yeah, wow. which really essentially set my business up. And I was, you know, completely transparent with them saying, you know, I am young and I do have the support of, you know, all these you know, people around me, but in order to do this, I'd have to, you know, pretty much start my own business and I need this kind of capital to do it. And, and they did, they supported it, which, yeah. was, a, which was amazing. So how old were you at the time? I think 25, 26. That's amazing. You know, not even registered. You should probably delete that. <laughs> um, we won't tell the ARBV. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, I think 
you know, I, like I kind of think part of my confidence in accepting it and being cheeky and asking for the money I did was actually the experiences that I had, you know, with you know my you know, working in my you know previous you know roles at ARM and. Um, you know, it is part business, this kind of career, you know, and you have to be savvy and you have to think about your hourly rates and, you know, how that times out. Mm. Like, it's sort of like even when I was, you know, doing Studio Studio Bird, you know, 100%, um, I was still teaching and, you know, really enjoyed sort of that relationship. Essentially running studios around my practice sounds a little bit convoluted, but, you know, the best way that I teach is by, you know, sharing and developing ideas that I'm interested in. Yeah. And, you know, I think with students, it, in play, you know, you start developing incredible collaborations and, you know, building, you know, new ideas. So I definitely um, had, had enough money to support myself, but not enough to, you know, have employees. So I really soon, soon started to pick out students to help me work on projects. And it's really fantastic to, you know, bring them from, like, you know, the institution into the, you know, mm. the, you know small practice. And, and then you're helping them and then they're helping you at the same time. So absolutely. everybody benefits. It goes both ways. So, yeah. the, so you're currently teaching indus- uh, sorry, interior architecture yep. at Monash. Can you explain exactly what is interior architecture as opposed to an interior course? Yeah. And an architecture course. For sure. I'm, I'm going to sound like Monash PR as I do this. <laughs> no, that, go for it. That WOW is Monash University at the moment. You know, I've, I started working there two years ago. They, they found me. They said, Matt, can we work for our, you know, our new interior revamped team? They thought I sort of fitted the role because I have this interdisciplinary nature, like I slip between disciplines. And, you know, what interior archi- architecture is, is a bit of architecture and a bit of interior, you know, to say it really plainly. And, and the way we advocate our role is really about responding to an existing condition. Yep. You know, whether it's an, in, an interior space of an old warehouse or it's a response to, you know, an urban question or problem. Um, it sort of is really quite broad. And, you know, over the four years of the program, you know, you really start with the unorthodox with me, like I sort of lead the first years. Um, you know, in, in questioning space and how we can, you know, um, you know, transform space, you know, um, with, you know, I guess a response to an existing condition. And clear to the way architecture falls in is that we actually teach our students or skill our students up in all the pragmatics of what it is to practice architecture. So, you know, basically as an interior architect, you can be a lot more ambitious with your ideas. It's a really good, well-rounded education. Yeah. Because so, yeah. so much of it does overlap. The interior side and the, the architecture side. I like. I think you know that I always get the million dollar question, you know, from new students. What kind of a job am I going to get out, out of this course? And I think you know, there's a number of ways of thinking about it. You can work in an architecture office. There's always an interior division, um, in, in a, you know, a larger firm. You, you could work actually at you know a gallery space, you know, and help be part of the curatorial team or program team. You know, you could essentially, you know, work for an interior architecture firm proper, like a small firm, or, you know, dare I say it, you know, with a little bit of experience, start your own business, you know, and, and find a way of, you know, essentially, you know, manifesting your design ideas you know, to what scale it's up to you. So in the, in the course, how much emphasis do you place on student presentations? Oh, like heaps? <laughs> heaps? For sure. Um, oh, yeah, com- com- communication is essential. And it's not necessarily just what's up on the wall or in the model. It's actually the way, you know, you portray your work through your voice and your verbal dialogue. So definitely, you know, it's verbal and visual communication um, skills are essential in the course. And I guess, you know, it's really about how to best communicate your idea. And, and for me, it's about doing it in a personal manner. You know, I don't necessarily think we should all be robots and, you know, just spitting out our ideas. I think... You know, the creative originality is essential and the only way that you can market that, you know, whether it's at uni or later on in your career, is by actually getting, um, you know, an, a client on board and, or, you know, your, you know, your review panel or, or whatever. And I think it's about having that dialogue, you know, and, that, and I think that's a personal dialogue. I think it's, you know, it combines with, you know, being able to reflect upon your work. You know, so yes, you have to have some brilliant ideas. And yes, you need to be able to present your ideas um, in a visual communication skill that's completely suitable to the ideas. But I think you, the best way to present those ideas is through reflective ways. So actually understand what the project is that you've designed and how it fits in on you know, many different scales, you know, from, I guess, you know, the, the education scale right through to the pragmatic and 
um, worldly scale as well. Like, where does your project fit into an historic lineage? Um, and be, you know, and this comes with experience and time, and be able to communicate your ideas holistically, you know, and essentially in a way that is simple. You know, yes, you're in an institution in a university, but you don't have to speak academically. You know, no. especially in design. You know, it's about. There's a bit, a bit of marketing you got to get, you know, in your language, but it's really about, you know, presenting your ideas in a simple and efficient manner that's compelling. You know, what, do you, what do you find the students do well in terms of their presentations? I think, well, the current, in the last couple of years at Monash, I think our students have definitely, and my, maybe it's just the generation or something, I think that they're likeable and you want to listen to them, you know, and, you know, maybe a generation before that, that wasn't the case. I won't dwell on the negative, but I think you know the, the, the group that's coming through at the moment actually gives a shit and definitely wants to succeed. And in order to do that, I think that you know maybe it's you know being born in 1995 or something. I don't know. Ah, <laughs> um, uh, today's you. <laughs> but they're you know, proactive, you know, and they want to learn and they want to learn how to best communicate their ideas. And you know, I really love working with these students because. You know, there's that dedication oriented. And so that, that comes through in the way they communicate their ideas and their pitch. Definitely nervous, but I love nerves because it means that they give a shit, you know? And if they didn't have nerves and they were too confident, I'd be like, oh, hello. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. I'm, like, I'm excited for this, this group that's coming through at the moment. Like, they're definitely the ones to watch. Like, I, you know, and I've kind of, I can't say I've been around, around for forever, but definitely there's these waves, you know? And there's always the exception, of course, but... As a group, I think, you know, the born in 1994-95, soon to graduate, I guess, in a couple of years' time, you know, will be the leaders. And I've met a couple of your students, and they were so enthusiastic and so passionate about the work that they were doing, and that the way that they spoke about their, their final project cool. was really compelling, and, and, yeah. and it was really interesting for me, who'd never seen it before. Now can we, they're sorry, first, in their first year. Their first year, that's insane. so good. It's really, really good. <laughs> it's, a, it's a reflection on you as well, that you've been able to instill in them this sort of enthusiasm and, and got, get them really excited about a project. I mean, it's a collaboration, you know, with myself. I have sessional staff, of course, that are helping, so it's not just me. But it's that collaborative spirit, I think, always mm. translates. Now, we've talked about what they do well. Yeah. Now I'd like to ask you, what do the students do that's not so great in terms of their presentation? What's the number one thing that they struggle with, in your opinion? I think, and I'm just talking completely generally, mm. so it's you know, the exception either way. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. one of the struggles that students today have is the visual communication. You know, we've got all this technology, all you know, these different software programs like you know, Illustrator CAD. Rhino, like AutoCAD, everything. There's, so, there's like a suite of too many programs to use. And I think it's just trying to work out and navigate which programs are the best programs, you know, that will work for their project, their specific project. I think line weights, <laughs> that sounds really trivial, but, you know, when you look, important, though. you're looking at work and the line weights aren't working on a sort of architectural drawings, design drawings, you're like, you just don't understand the project. You don't understand the sense of space and you know, the, the experience through space. But my advice, and it always has been, is less is more and you know, um, spend the hours that are required, you know, which are, yes, heaps, to actually get it right. Don't just be lazy and do it once and think you'll be able to skip through and off you go. Definitely university years are the, the almost like the apprentice years to a certain extent, especially in today's kind of format of design university mm. you know use this time the studio time to actually skill yeah. up and get the skills perfect yeah. it's a really good habit to get into yeah starting at, at uni just with the just, um, focusing more on the, on the visual uh, yep. presentations do you I mean g generally speaking do you have physical boards or do students present with like a slideshow like a digital presentation I'm, I'm like so for me, this is a little bit old school. I prefer the printed poster as opposed to the digital, unless there's a compelling reason, you know. Yes, you might have a fly through, or you might have some amazing, beautiful film that you've made, or there's an audio quality that you want to present, but I, I would say that should, the digital should always be in combination with the hard print. Because definitely in an architectural world, interior architectural world, it's about, you know, how the line weights translates in the printed format. 
And I think one of the faults with having a digital presentation is that your reviewers or your future clients will forget stuff. You know, so it'd be five slides before and they've already forgotten it. Whereas if you've got it all printed out on the wall, you see the full suite. Yeah. You know, and, and of course, there's you know the next question of you know how do you lay out the work stuff? I guess. You know, and that's something that I always found I ran out of time for because I was yeah. during semester I was so focused on the design itself. Then it would get to sort of two weeks before the presentation, and I think, oh crap, I haven't actually thought about how this is all going to figure out. What, yeah. what's, what's your advice to students? How, how soon should they be thinking about how they're going to visually represent their project? I reckon like a third of the way through, so quite early on. Quite early. Yeah, um, and you know, have a set format to the poster in mind already. You know, things can change, of course, along the way, but if you use InDesign, which I would. You know, t- you know, tell everybody to please use. You know, use InDesign to you know go back and forth. You know, just dumping it on, and it's about that iterative quality of you know building up your poster. So that obviously needs to go in combination with the way you're going to talk about your work. But start early, and then you know the extents of work that you need to sort of fill in. You know, you have placeholders on the poster. Otherwise, you don't want to leave it to that last minute kind of moment. Like I'm like you, I you know, used to do that as well as a student. Like and you know honestly I wasn't savvy at InDesign then and it was horrific to try and pull it together at the last minute and you know you could see that my our projects could be better potentially because yeah. we've just got caught up with you know doing mundane things at the last minute and even details like designing the the heading of the the, 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 the font of your yeah. of of the actual or even um, coming up with a project name and representing that visually to also reflect yeah. your main idea. I remember spending quite a bit of time just trying to figure out how the, the yeah. may, I don't know if it was too much time or whatever, yeah. but it's I think it's something that I didn't learn until right towards my end of univer- towards the end of university yeah. uh, how important it is to actually think about how you want your presentation, how you want your project to read, mm. whether it's a long linear presentation or if it's stacked vertically or if it just, just how, how do you want it to actually uh, like read I, to the, the viewer? It's a, you know, I don't want to give myself more work, but to an extent, your tutor, your lecturer is getting paid to do their job. And so the more time you have with them to actually answer those questions, ask those questions and, you know, have a collaborative sort of answer to those questions, the better. So whether it's portrait, vertical, you know, portrait, landscape, whether it's a digital slideshow, whether or not you need to build a massive model to go with it, that's part of the deal of your tutor. You know, you need to be working and collaborating with them to help answer those questions. So always be communicating with your tutor about... Absolutely, yeah. uh, ...about, not just about the, the design or the concept itself, but about the presentation. For sure. That's yeah. awesome. That's really good advice. Start from day one as well and don't be that shy kid in the background. And I, like, honestly, this generation of born in 995 actually has, the, you know, that confidence to... I don't know if you remember at uni, I was too shy to even ask a question. <laughs> like, you know, I didn't want to get my head ripped. So I should probably say this generation has it set because we're all friendly and lovely, but if you studied in the early 2000s, and at a certain university, everybody, <laughs> generally speaking, were ruthless. I think tutors, I think tutors these days are a lot more um, personable, yeah, just, <laughs> just a bit, a bit more approachable and yeah. easier to get along with. Like you are, like you said, like like a collaborator rather than someone of authority who's standing over you and telling you what you can and can't do. That master and apprentice. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. We're all human beings at the end of the day. You know, <laughs> we all sleep the same hours, hopefully. You know, we all have, especially in you know design and architecture, we all have this bizarre life of you know wanting to create all the time. So, yeah, yeah we are one big family to a certain extent. And, yeah. you know, this relationship will be, it begins at university and then it continues to foster on. Like, you know, and, you know, you hang out with design people all the time. So, you know, awesome. you've got to be friendly. Now, now before, uh, before we get to the end of the interview, I just want to ask you one last thing. Now, with everyone that I interview on the podcast, I like to play the two things game. Have you heard of the two things? No, no. Okay. It's, it's based on the idea that for any subject or topic, there are only really two things that you need to know about okay. it. 
in any topic. In any topic, it, it can be just summed, summed down into two things, and anything else is just an application of those two things, or it's just not important. All right. So, for example, uh, the two things about driving: number one, don't hit anything, yeah. and number two, don't let anything hit you. Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, what I want to ask you, Matthew, is. In your opinion, what are the two things about architectural experimentation? Oh, wow. <laughs> Good question. Um, long pause, sorry. I think, <laughs> I think, really, oh, I guess. That's okay, I've put, I've put you right on the spot. Yeah. So, if you could yeah. sum it into just two, just two things. Okay, yeah, so what if, you know, stop and take the time and ask yourself, what if? And yeah. it can be absolutely extreme, you know. What if we decided to paint the Opera House green? What would that mean? And then, you know, I think that the, the, the way that you would support that, or the second aspect to the what if, is just go and do it. Yeah. And, you know, I you know, mentioned this, you know, don't ask questions, just go do it, kind of gorilla methodology that I have going on. There are ways to do stuff, you know, and I think there's an audience for that as well. So, yeah, so ask the what if questions, you know, the uncanny, silly, unorthodox, experimental kind of. Yep. Questions that have those kind of outcomes. And then just go do it. You know, be proactive. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Oh. Well, thanks so much, Matthew, for your time. It's been Absolutely. a pleasure chatting and you've shared some really great insights and I'm sure everyone listening is just really inspired and maybe maybe even a bit inspired to go out and do their own gorilla projects. Yes, please. Projects. So the, yeah. it'd be great to see more of that. And Melbourne's a fantastic city to encourage that and help facilitate that we're all very open to, For sure. to that so I look forward to seeing much more of your work uh, not just in Melbourne but around the world as cool. well so yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you Matthew well no it's my pleasure and I, and I guess you know go do that silly project and really enjoy when you know the random person comes up to you on the street or wherever it is and goes what on earth is that that's the cool bit yeah. that's when you know you've succeeded when yeah. you have that curious person yeah. and where, where can people find you online Matthew yeah, no, I've got a couple of sort of streams. Definitely um, my website, studiobird.com.au, but I also have a decent Facebook page, which is Studio Bird as well. Oh, it's more than decent. Yeah. I've had a look. It's pretty good. Thank you. Lots, yeah. of, lots of really cool photos and yeah. um, and new, news about, about what you're up to and Definitely. all your projects. And there's some crazy exciting things happening this year, so be worth worth liking. Yeah. And, you know, maybe <laughs> if you're interested, definitely drop me a line. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll put a link. I'll put a link in the show notes to Matthew's Facebook page and then to his Studio Bird page as well for all those listening. All right. Thanks so much, Matthew. Oh, thanks so much, Christina. <laughs> Cheers. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Matthew Bird from Studio Bird. I'll put a link to his website and his Facebook page in the show notes at Design Draw Speak dot com slash zero one zero so that's zero ten okay so for the challenge of the week now here in Australia many students are about to start new semesters at university so if if that's you I just like to th- I'd like you to think as you go into your first classes in the next few weeks I'd like you to take your page out of Matthew's gorilla design book and and think about what if but in terms of what what if what's going to happen with your with your project this semester and I'd like you to write something down right now uh, except if you're driving in, in which case just hold that thought for the moment now think outside the box think about how you could approach your design project this semester so for example what if I drew my design inspiration from a film or a song or what if I did the opposite to everyone else in my class? What would that look like? Or what if I presented my design at the end of semester through poetry instead of talking? What if I were to challenge the brief as much as possible? What if I painted myself blue? What if I built my model out of salted caramel? You know, it goes on and on and on. You can go be as crazy as you want. Now, it may sound really out there, but when you aim for something that's super crazy, you will then start to consider all the things in between that 
may have originally seemed out of reach or just not possible. Really use this time that you have at uni to push for the crazy, the ludicrous, the seemingly impossible, because you never know where these ideas will take you. But wherever it is, I'm certain it will be somewhere truly remarkable. So that brings us to the end of episode 10. Thanks so much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you have, I would love it if you could leave a quick review and rating in the iTunes store. It's almost disappointingly easy. Just go to designdrawspeak.com and follow the links to iTunes. And of course, tell all your friends or anyone you think would also like a weekly dose of awesome, inspiring and fun presentation tips. You guys are amazing. I hope you have an outrageously good week. And until next time, this has been Presentation Skills for Design Students, helping you become a confident, creative communicator.